29 AD, there was one about to change the world. Fully man, fully God, Jesus. Next to him was a friend who witnessed everything. He saw early miracles. He sat at his right hand. His own eyes saw Jesus transfigured. The very heart of Christ was poured out to him, and he was there at the cross on the day history was altered. These are the words and the story of John. All right, as he said, yes, I am Bill's son, if you couldn't tell, and uh, I'm his youngest son. Um, I am grateful to be up here. Um, man, <laughs> I love this group of guys, man. It's hard not to look out at, at this group and just be like, it's a special group, man. I'll look at the guy sitting next to you, to the right and to the left of you, and just be amazed at how good, uh, how good this group is. And so I'm blessed to be, be able to stand before you um, the Lord's taught me a lot through, through John chapter 10, and so I hope I can communicate it clearly to y'all, and that uh, everything that's been helpful to me, I hope will be really helpful to you as well, and so we'll jump into this. On January 5th of this year, I officially ended my career as an employee of our family business. I grew up work, working for Packmore. I swept and mopped floors. I packed bags and boxes on the production lines. I worked in maintenance, and every Friday, I enjoyed my favorite Hot summer, is this thing, is this doing all right here? All right, cool. I enjoyed my favorite hot summer activity of climbing up on our flat roofs and sweeping water off the roofs every Friday so that water wouldn't leak into the plants. It was a real privilege. So because of that, uh, I did graduate from high school and I went to college and I got a business degree uh, and I worked, went and worked for a company up in Westfield called IMMI for a couple years uh, working as a salesperson. After a couple of years and realizing that I hated selling things to people, uh, I had the privilege of rejoining the family business. And so I started there, sort of where I left off, back where I was familiar, working on the production lines. And from there, I fortunately and gratefully made my way up uh, through the ranks. You know, it's funny because manufacturing, if anyone in here is familiar with it, it's not at all glamorous or sexy. It's no, it's no tech or anything like that, but um, I really loved what we did. I loved the people, and at the time that I quit that job, there wasn't a person I didn't know. There wasn't a problem I couldn't solve or a problem that I didn't know the person who could solve it. And there were very few activities or tasks in that business that I couldn't do myself or teach, teach someone to do, uh, to do that task. And I knew the job. I knew the business, and it felt good. It, it feels good to be good at something, and that was one of those things I was like, man, this, this feels really good. It was really satisfying. And then I left. We sold the business. And I left the confidence and surety of that role uh, to be here, to do this, to be with you guys, getting to, to know all of you, uh, growing alongside each other and loving each other. And so since, uh, since January, I've been thinking about John chapter 10. This idea of the, the good shepherd and the sheep really holds uh, a special place in my heart. And so in, in January and February, knowing that I would have this opportunity to teach, I was trying to get f more familiar with the, with the text. You know, I'm like, man, it's January. I'm going to be preaching pretty late in the, in the year, so let's get ahead on this thing. And so I started trying to make some headway on it, and uh, kind of oddly enough, I started to experience some tension and, and some frustration as I did that. And it showed up uh, really in my in my quiet times in the morning. And so I'd, I'd sit down and I'd try to, try to study the Bible or read and pray. And, and with, this, with this lecture sitting in the back of my mind, I would, I would hear this voice in my head. And it would say, you don't know what you're doing. How are you gonna come up with what to say? You better get focused or you're gonna drop the ball and embarrass yourself. And for months, for months, that was the voice that I heard most days. I would try to have some quiet time with the Lord and I would hear that voice, and I, I kind of froze, honestly. My prayers were weak, my study time uh, was shallow, and I went into most days just feeling overwhelmed with anxiety and doubt and fear. And this continued through April, with the voice changing as my life changed. Every time I would go to work on something other than this lecture, even the things I needed to do, I would hear in my head, what are you doing, Kyle? You should be working on the lecture. You're not being obedient. You need to be using your free time to write and prepare. See, you're not being obedient. If you were, you'd be working on the lecture. And with that voice in my mind during those days and weeks and months, 
as you can imagine, I was, I was just feeling really beat down and, and tired and also confused. I'll, I'll finish that story up at the end of this, um, but there's a few things that I hope you'll take away from the message tonight. Number one is that you'll walk away with an eagerness to listen for God's voice. Number two is that you'll have a desire to know his voice more and, and, and to know it more confidently. That you'll walk away with a commitment to follow him above all else and that you'll do so in a community of Christian men. So let's open with prayer and let's ask God to help us this evening. Father God, you are, you are so good. You are a good shepherd. Lord, lift up our ears now. Lift them out of the dirt. Lift them out of the distractions. Lord, silence the voices that are around us. Help us to hear your voice. And God, I pray also that my voice, my mannerisms, my nerves, whatever, wouldn't be a distraction. God, we need your voice. Help us listen, know, follow you. God, we need you. Holy Spirit, fill us and fill this place. In Jesus' name, amen. So when I was in college, um, I spent a summer living in Kenya working on a cattle ranch. And while I was there, I started to think that I wanted to be a cattle rancher. And so in the summer of 2014, to gain some more experience in the world of, of ranching, uh, I went and got a job working for a, a farm in Hillsborough, Texas, which was just north of Baylor where I went to college. One week during the summer, myself and one of the other ranch hands were sent up to Oklahoma to help a fellow rancher cull through and castrate a large herd of sheep. I'm not going to cover that second part. Don't worry. But uh, when we got to the, to the ranch, it was early morning, and I can still picture, picture the scene like it, like, like it was yesterday. I'm standing there next to this corral, and the sun is coming up behind the hills of Oklahoma, and I'm looking out on the horizon, and there's a cowboy riding in on a horse with a, with a herd of sheep following behind him. And he, he's leading the sheep, and they, they follow him into the corral. It was, it was a scene that was just so serene and special. It was like, man, this should, be, this should be a painting. But in that moment, in the next moment, the tranquility of that scene was broken, and complete chaos ensued. As soon as the sheep heard me and the other ranch hands come over the fence and into the corral, they just started going completely nuts. It was insane. So I, I never worked with sheep uh, before this. We had cows, we had chickens, but I never worked with sheep. And I remember we hop over the rail and these sheep were like relatively happy. And we hop in and they just start like swarming around us, like just swarming around us. And I, can, I remember in the corner there was... Um, uh, there was a, a hole in the fence that looked like it was just big enough for a sheep's head to fit through. And the sheep seemed to th think the same thing as well because I remember watching sheep after another, bang, bang, bang. These sheep are slamming their heads into this fence, just boom, 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 diving through the fence or into the fence, not fitting, but trying to go through that hole to escape myself and these other strangers that they did not know. These sheep didn't know who I was, but they clearly knew I was not their shepherd and they were not going to do what I wanted them to do. In John chapter 10, Jesus makes it clear that there are three characteristics which define those who are truly his sheep. So the question is, how do you know who your shepherd is? Jesus says that his sheep listen to his voice. They know his voice and they follow him. In John 10, verses two through three, Jesus says, but he who enters by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. To him, the gatekeeper opens. The sheep hear his voice and he calls out, calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. And then in verses seven through eight, he says, truly, truly, I say to you, I am the door of the sheep. All who came before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not listen to them. The sheep in that corral in Oklahoma had ears that were listening and attentive. They weren't buried in the dirt or distracted by all this beautiful fresh grass in the corral that they could have been eating. They arrived at where we were because they were listening for their shepherd who had called them and was leading them. They had a desire to listen to and hear their shepherd, and they trusted him because he was good. 
And so the next question is, what is the posture of my, what's the posture of your heart and your ears towards God? I accepted Christ when I was eight years old, and I confidently believe that I was saved and marked as a child of God at that moment. But as time went on and I, I moved into high school, I became enthralled with the things that the world offered. Alcohol, sex, drugs, stealing, whatever made me feel good or gave me a rush, I was up for it. I was game. And the crazy part is that I grew up in Bible study. I knew God's voice, but I was ignoring him. I wasn't listening. I chose to not hear Jesus, even though I was aware that he was speaking. In what area of your life are you ignoring the voice of Jesus? For me, I loved the thrill of getting drunk and having sex. I wanted those things way more than I wanted Jesus. And right now, it's comfort. I often want things to be easy and to not hurt more than I want to hear from Jesus. What in your life is captivating your heart or mind and keeping you from listening to and hearing the voice of Jesus? Jesus' sheep listen to him. The second characteristic of Jesus' sheep that stands out in this text is that Jesus' sheep know his voice. In John 10, 4, Jesus states when he has brought out all his own, he goes before them and the sheep follow him for they know his voice. And then in verse 14, he says, I am the good shepherd. I know my own and my own know me. You know, when I worked at Packmore, uh, one of the things that always made my day was when my dad would come, would come work at the plant. Um, so he wasn't always at the plant. He, he started out there, but as time progressed, um, he had a team who would run the day-to-day -day operations, and then he was also out casting vision for the company and doing other things, and so he wasn't there all the time. But when he was, when he walked in the door, as soon as he spoke, I knew it was my dad. And it wasn't just the sound of his voice that made me confident it was him. It was the words he used. It was the way he spoke them, the energy behind them, the confidence in them, the tenderness around them, and it was the effect his words had on the recipient. Without seeing him, when he spoke, I could hear his smile. I could sense his mood. As soon as he walked in the door and said, hi, Jenny, our receptionist's name, I knew it was my dad. How could I be so confident? I've been alive for 30 years and except for maybe a couple days when I was out of the country or at summer camp or something like that, there's very rarely been a day when I haven't heard my father's voice. We've had long talks, short talks, quiet talks, and we've experienced uh, many of my life's greatest joys together and nearly all of my life's most painful, gut-wrenching moments together. I know my dad's voice. My question is, how well do you how well do I know God's voice? Do you know the words he uses? Do you only know his words? Or do you also know his heart as well? How sure are you when you hear his voice that it is truly him? Truly knowing someone's voice comes from hours, days, and years of interacting with them learning how they speak, what phrases they use, what emotions are behind their words, and watching how their character informs what they say. What do you need to change to help you spend more time with Jesus in the Bible, in Bible study, prayer, listening to sermons, reading books, or, other Christ or with other Christians so that you can know it is Jesus when he speaks? Jesus' sheep know his voice. The third and final characteristic that we see emphasized in this text is that Jesus' sheep follow him. But again, in uh, verses two, 2 through 4, he says, But he who enters by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. When he has brought out all his own, he goes before them, and the sheep follow him, for they know his voice. And then in verse 27, he says, My sheep hear my voice. I know them and they follow me. Going back to my life as a high schooler, if someone would have asked me, I'd have said, oh, for sure, man, I'm, I'm definitely a follower of Jesus. But if you looked at my life, it didn't look 
anything different than all the people around me who would have said the exact opposite. If you'd have asked them, they'd be like, are you kidding me? I am not at all a follower of Jesus. My life looked just like theirs. In Matthew 16, 24, Jesus states, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. I still struggle with this, but especially in high school, before I chose to truly seek after Jesus, there was no ounce of me that was denying myself, choosing to suffer for Christ and, and walking down his path. To follow Jesus means that I say in my heart, I am submitting to the leadership of Jesus Christ. I remember, um, I remember sitting in O'Hare Airport uh, after the senior year of, my, of high school, after two full years of just going all out, all in, uh, doing everything that the world said would make me feel happy and make me feel satisfied. And I was sitting there in the airport in one of the terminals. My mom was sitting next to me. I just broke down sobbing. And I, I remember just sitting there and I was just like, okay, God, I can't do this anymore. I've, I've, I've tried everything that the world says will make me happy, will make me feel good, will satisfy my soul and I know it does not satisfy my soul. And I said, all right, Lord, I want to follow you now. I want to follow you. Please, please help me. And from that point on, God has transformed me. He's broken me. He's helped me. And he's done what he promises in Psalm 23. And he's led me on paths of righteousness. How adamantly are you following Jesus? Are you waffling back and forth between God's path and your path? What is God calling you to let go of today so that you will follow him with full commitment? I left Packmore to join Heart of a Man because I prayed hard. I sought the Lord. I knew his voice, and he answered me. And yet, despite the clarity and the confidence that I had and that I have in God's voice in that decision, as I prepared for this lecture, the voice of the devil was clear in my ears. You are not enough. You are disobedient. You are going to fail. And I was wanting to hear God's voice. I was pleading with him. I was saying, God, please, please help me. I'm, I'm listening. Help me hear you. I knew his voice. I've memorized his word. I've watched him work. And I've come to know the character of Jesus. And... I, I, I knew it was the devil I was hearing. I knew all those things. I knew his character. I knew his voice. I've memorized his word. And I'm, I'm sitting there. I'm like, I know this is the devil. I know this is the devil. I know this is the devil. And yet, despite all of that, I honestly still remained confused. I was still like, man, I don't know. Maybe it's right. You know, I'm I mean, I'm not like always working on this. I am working on that. You know, uh, he's saying, I'm, this voice is saying I'm disobedient. I'm like, I'm not really being obedient. Maybe, maybe he's right. Maybe, maybe what he's saying is true. Until after months and months of churning through this by myself, I finally sat down with some of the guys in this room. <laughs> and I said, y'all, I'm struggling. And I described what I've just shared with you all. And it was then Side by side with some of my fellow sheep that I could see, the devil had been in my ear, but my shepherd was still right before, before me, leading me on the path of righteousness. And the cool part, you guys, is that that whole struggle, I mean, this started in January. That was every day, you guys. I'm hearing this, hearing this, struggling. Is, I don't know. Is it this? Is it that? Am I obedient? I don't, am I not? Whose voice is this? And and amazingly enough, that whole struggle, that, that's the illustration that God was preparing for the very sermon that I was stressing about. That's how God works. In Ezekiel 31, God says, I myself will search for my sheep and I will seek them out. As a shepherd seeks his flock when he is among his sheep that have been scattered, so I will seek out my sheep and I will rescue them. What happens to sheep when they're isolated, alone, and apart from the flock. They need to be rescued because they get, they get abused and battered and even killed when they're apart from the flock. 
There are many reasons that God relates us to sheep, but one of them is that sheep don't fare well when they're alone. We as the sheep must listen to, know, and follow our shepherd, and we must do all those things, and we must stay close to the flock without Jesus and without Christians close by us. We are vulnerable. And so a few final questions to reiterate what, we've just, what I've just shared. The first is, are you, are you listening? Are you listening to Jesus? Have you accepted Christ as your savior, as your king, as your shepherd? Man, if you're sitting here and, and you're like, ah, I don't know, man. Like, I kind of like to drink. I kind of like to, man, having sex outside of marriage is pretty cool. I'm telling you, you guys, <laughs> it's better This is so much better. I promise you it's better. Life is hard no matter what you do, but following Jesus is so much better. Ask the guy sitting next to you. It's better. I promise. I promise. I've been there. And if you know you have accepted Christ, what in your life is captivating your heart and mind and keeping you from from listening to him, from listening to Jesus and hearing his voice? How do you know it's him? The devil will talk to you. He's probably whispering in your ear right now, trying to distract you and trying to keep you from hearing God's voice in this moment. What do you need to change to help you spend more time in lots of contexts, in lots of different ways with Jesus, in Bible study, prayer, listening to sermons, reading books, serving with other Christians, so that just like how I know my dad, because I spent a lot of time with my dad in a lot of settings. How can you do that with Jesus so that you can know it is him when he speaks? Jesus said, my sheep know my voice and they follow me. Simple question, are you a follower of Jesus? What is God calling you to let go of today so that you can follow him with full commitment? Finally, what Christian brothers or mentors can you turn to to help you listen to, know, and follow Jesus? This is is convicting for me. I, I spent four months, you guys, doing this by myself and struggling. And really, like I said, my time in the morning was so it just felt weak and 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 I didn't reach out to guys. And so I want to push you guys to the same push I need, which is what do you need to change this week? so that you will stop being alone and vulnerable. We're vulnerable sheep on our own. Even with Jesus, we're still vulnerable. We need our sheep around us. So what do you need to change so you can stop being alone and start being a man who follows Jesus in close proximity to other believers? Lastly, to close, I ask you guys just just close your eyes with me for a second. Listen to these beautiful words of Psalm 23 that describe our good shepherd. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely, goodness and mercy, goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. And and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Mm. Father God, you are our good shepherd. Mm. Help us to listen. Help us to know you better. Help us to follow you with no very little distraction, Lord. Thank you that when we go off course, you come back and you rescue us. When I'm alone, you bring me back to the flock so that I can, I can be redirected towards you. You're so good. You're so good. Help these men. Help me. Help us to be good sheep and good followers of you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.